thanks very much for the uh, the invitation. It's always difficult to follow Jim, Lord Jim O'Neill, and not be accused of being a harbinger of even worse events. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to start and finish on a slightly more optimistic note. I'm going to go through a very personal perspective of uh, the, the vulnerability of, of the world to uh, change, which is really what my talk's about, although through the prism of infectious diseases. Um, to highlight just how vulnerable we are now, um, and that, that is a truism across environmental change, climate change, urbanization, trade and everything, but one of the aspects, and it's my own personal background, around emerging infections is clearly uh, a part of that. But also, positively, and it sort of came through a bit in Jim's talk, but I think is absolutely critical to appreciate, and that is we are not passive observers of history. We, we can change the world, and I think Wired and the community that you represent has, I think, over the last decade or so, demonstrated that more than any other community. And perhaps the message to you today is my community, the biomedical, the global health community, really desperately needs the number of hands that go up when Jim asks those questions to increase. And I would argue there is no more exciting part of activities at the moment than what I'm going to talk about. And we desperately need my community to open its doors and broaden out and to try and persuade some of you to come into that world because your skills could change that world for the benefit of us all. Um, and, and we desperately need you. So this is me. Um, a little bit younger in 1960X. Um, I, was, I was born in Asia and I was brought up in a number of countries which when you go through American customs now looks a bit dodgy. Um, uh, seven years in Libya doesn't go down well with American customs. Um, and the top picture in the middle there is of what is now the um, central business district of Singapore. That is at Singapore as I knew as a child. And, and this is not centuries ago, I promise you. This is only actually a few decades ago. But I remember walking through the central business district as now constructed in Singapore, walking over open sewers uh, and people living in those houseboats. Um, that's how change can happen. Uh, and that is now the headquarters of HSBC. Um, uh, and it just demonstrates what, how the world can change if you make the right decisions. I then came to this country, trained in medicine, PhD in immunology. And then, halfway through a talk not dissimilar to this, realised that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life working with a pile of British neurologists, and so went off to Vietnam thinking I'd be going there for a couple of years and stayed for 18. Um, and for some reason, which I still do sometimes question, came back two years ago. This is where I worked, um, and although one can look back on it now with affection, this is the biggest infectious disease hospital in the world in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, southern Vietnam, um, and a lot of very good friends on that. But actually, uh, my interest uh, th then moved into emerging infections, and I can promise you it was, it has, it was the most terrifying times of my life. I, I may be the only person in the world that has direct personal, two pl personal contact uh, with SARS, with bird flu, uh, with Ebola, with pandemic of 2009, and a number of other epidemics which wouldn't have caught your attention. But I can promise you during the middle of that, when you are looking after a patient in front of you that you would no idea what is wrong with them, but you had friends who last week died of SARS, is a very, very eye-opening moment for you. And that happened in 2003, 2004, and uh, my professional life changed as a result of that. But having had this view out of my window um, for 18 years, for some slightly odd reason, which I do sometimes question, I gave all of that up, and I took to a daily commute from Oxford into London with Great Western Railway, now Chiltern Railways, um, and I uh, haven't regretted it for a minute to now come and run. <laughs> The head of the Wellcome Trust, which is, as David said, uh, an 18 billion pound real jewel in British crown, I think. And uh, 700 million was right. We sincerely hope we will be able to give away, invest, fund, grant uh, over a billion pounds per year over the next five years. Uh, and we are looking to give that away to the best people, some of whom may well be in this room. Global health is often portrayed, and you often hear about it in the news, as a real negative and as a frightening prospect. I think it is really important to step back and just, just acknowledge some of the success stories. Because if you have no success story, it's often difficult to think there's anything we can do, and therefore let's do nothing. Since the turn of the century, 700 million people around the world have not had malaria as a result 
of what the Wellcome has done and the Bill and Melinda Gates done and the British government have done and many other governments around the world. 700 million people, mostly children, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, have been able to go to school, been able to work, been able to contribute to the economy, been able to live a normal life because of science and the way science was implemented across the world. That is a staggering statistic. So when we look forward and we think, gosh, drug resistance is going to take over, and it will if we don't act, we also must remember that if we do act and we take the right choices, we can stop these things happening. And that is really important. That degree of optimism is absolutely crucial because if there is no optimism, there is no sense of hope and there's no sense that one can do anything about it. And of those 700 million people, since the turn of the century, three and a half million people are alive today as a result of changes that were made uh, in malaria. So global health can work. What I think my community, the broadly biomedical community has not appreciated is that over the period of the last few decades the world has changed. That vision of Singapore and the open sewers which is now the central business district is a truism across the world. The two images here, the one in 1976 is that is the Ebola River. That is the Ebola River where the first outbreak that uh, Peter Piot, now at the London School, identified that Ebola River and the, the virus that caused an outbreak in, 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 in that region. <laughs> Just look at the community that surrounds that river. There are a few houses that it's difficult to spot. The communities are mostly villages of two to three hundred people. They may be a few kilometers from the next village. Controlling that epidemic was not trivial, but relatively easy. Now switch forward to 2014 and the start of the Ebola outbreak. That is the community where that epidemic occurred. The virus hasn't changed. The human genetic component hasn't changed. What has changed a society? And that changes everything. So instead of a little village where one can corral, one can control, one can isolate, you've now got the interconnectivity that comes with multi-million urbanized centers. And the connectivity and the way individuals, their families and society operate is completely different in that setting. And so therefore one's ability to deal with these emerging crises is completely different. And it's not because of the virology, it's not because of the fundamental science, it's because of the anthropology, the social sciences, the understanding of the human-animal interface, etc. And we've got to bridge that gap, but actually increasingly, particularly in the biomedical world, we are going into ever more silos. And we're less open, I think, than we were, for instance, when I went through training, to a broader community. And again, another statement, to reach out to your community to see if we can bring you in to what we're doing because technology is going to be critical to what Jim talked about and to what uh, I'm talking about. Another personal anecdote, my uncle, I, I'm the youngest of six, my, my uncle who I never knew um, travelled from London to Tehran in the 1930s. There is an interesting story because somehow he went missing and I don't know the details but um, I, can, I would like to find out. Anyway, he went to Tehran, so he left London, he flew to Paris, he then went to Rome, he then went to uh, Ankara, he then, it took him about nine days to get from London to Tehran. This is the world map of flights today. There are millions and millions of people in the air today. I would imagine that there's some people in this audience who yesterday were in Singapore or, uh, or Lagos and tomorrow will be in Washington. Our connectivity has transformed and the impact on emerging infections is absolutely crucial. When I first came to the UK, I got on a boat in Asia and I arrived in Southampton. That's why I have, apart from Everton, I've always slightly supported Southampton because it was the first sight for me of the UK as a young child, but memorised, was Southampton docks, not the best uh, thing to see necessarily of, of England. Now, of course, you would make that journey in less than 12 hours and that connectivity <coughs> is driving our inter interconnectivity and it's driving the risks of our ability to spread emerging infectious disease around the world. And there are some parts of the world where this is particularly true. In that circle, which doesn't look very big, in that circle lives about 60% of the world's population of humans and actually 75% of the world's chickens. So those, that interconnectivity between chickens, human beings, pigs, ducks, whatever it is, is now on a scale of, of, of close living unprecedented in human history and their ability to then go from that environment into the rest of the world is, is unprecedented. And the biggest growth of those blue lines across the world is now not Europe, North America, which is fairly static. It is now between Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. 
That is growing at an exponential rate as China, as, southern, as Southeast Asia, as Vietnam invests in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa. And that will have huge implications for the flow of people, of trade, and inevitably, therefore, also of mosquitoes, of rats, of animals, of domestic animals, and, and of course, of emerging infections. And the world is changing. David used to look like this <laughs> and increasingly looks like that. And that is not just here in London. That is the world over. And so that is also changing our nature of global health. In London, because of some enlightened people in the 19th century who put sewers under our roads, we largely sorted out infectious diseases in our world before the non-communicable diseases, the cancers, the diabetes, the cardiovascular disease, came. In many, many parts of the world, the vast majority of the parts of the world, those two things are happening in a conflated way. So David looks like that, and he's at risk of diabetes, at risk of cardiovascular disease, but he's also at risk of infectious diseases and the health systems have not got that right now and they cannot get that right without some real technological leaps forward and some advances in the way we collect and store data and that comes into your sort of world. So today, 29th of April 2016 and this, this is just from the top of my head, this is just the things I know about around the world at the moment, all of this list of things are going on today. These are not rare events. These events are happening every day of the year, and that's just a list from mine. So Ebola is still going on. There is a virus in the Middle East, which is a little bit like SARS and could spread at any time. And of course, we have on the back of that also uh, 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 drug resistance, as Jim's just talked about, and we are going to go to 9 billion people. We cannot keep doing things in our world in the same way, because we're not smart enough and we're not applying sufficient technologies. So this is what's happening. This is a few days ago. Every red dot on that is a potential SARS event, a potential bird flu event, a potential Ebola event. And sorting out the not important from the important is extraordinarily difficult. And we can sort of do that from a virological scientific perspective, but until we can start to sift massive amounts of data, we're not going to be able to make sense of that. And these things happen very quickly. This is the, the dreadful pandemic of 1918, when 20 to 40 million people died at a time when the world's population was uh, much smaller than it is today, about 2.5 billion. The white one is Mexico 2009. You have a six-week window to intervene quickly. In Ebola, if we'd intervened when that first child got infected in December 2013, if we'd intervened in that first six weeks, if we'd been smart enough to pick something was happening and had the appropriate response because of a much better use of technology, we would not have had 11,000 deaths from Ebola and, and 40,000 uh, cases coming out of it. So we can change the world as long as we see global health as something different, not as a narrow spectrum of my world, a clinician, a biomedical scientist, not in the narrow spectrum of a veterinarian, not in a technology person, but unless we learn to bring these together and bridge these gaps in the way we train the next generation and we open ourselves up to your communities and others, will we actually be able to bring this together and make sure that we uh, address the global health challenges for which we are very vulnerable uh, and do the right things? So global health in the 21st century, global health used to be in the context of something that was other people. It was something that happened in countries that we just saw in Panorama or Horizon programs. That is no longer true. What happens in Lagos yesterday will impact London tomorrow. And what happens in Paris today will impact Ho Chi Minh City tomorrow. We are just so interconnected. That's a huge positive, but there are some downsides to that. And the downsides are that that interconnectivity can breed the sort of resistance Jim talked about and the emergent pathogens that I talked about. So global health in the 21st century is not about other people. It is about you and I. And it's about our skills and our ability to use our professional skills, technological skills, and bring them together that would allow us to address these challenges. And we must appreciate that this is about changing societies and changing world as much as it is about changing viruses and other uh, scientific elements. So unless we learn to gather data, to use that data smartly, and to use it in real time, that six week period that I mentioned that we had to control Ebola. Unless we manage it in real time, we will not be able to prevent these things happening. But we can prevent them if we get it right. So finishing on a positive note, we are not passive observers of history. We can change the course of history, but we can't do it if we keep working in the silos that we've bought to date. David, with that, thank you very much, I'll stop. 
say that. So I'm going to go down from British Airways gold to silver, just to do my bit. Um, you've scared us a bit about the immediacy and the scale of the problem. How well suited are our current institutions, the international institutions, at confronting this in a way that can solve the problem? So, so two points there. These institutions you talk about were, were, were all established essentially in the idealism of the Second World War, 1940s, early 1950s, and that is true of the World Health Organization, the United Nations, IMF, the World Bank. They are not fit as currently constructed for the purpose of the 21st century, and they need to be reformed. They need to uh, be meritocratic. They, in my view, shouldn't be appointing somebody because it's America's turn or France's turn or whatever. It, it, it ha they have to improve and reform their processes. But my bigger worry, actually, as a, as a global community, is that we are retreating to some of the horrors of the 20th century and moving away from a sense of a collective global good to a, a more nationalistic agenda. And I think that's very, that is more frightening. I think these global bodies are absolutely crucial because we are all in it together and we shouldn't retreat into isolationism and, uh, and narrow nationalism. We've been there, it didn't work, and it wasn't good. We should be looking forward. So reform of the structures, maybe we need to actually have some new ones, but let's not move away from a sense of a common good. So let's invent a new international body here at Wide Health today that can be more constructive, more immediately effective than some of those organizations. What kind of organization would it be? If you were running it, where would you start? Well, firstly, I, I think it, it, it has to be representative, ultimately, although obviously nation states are an incre a, a difficult term to define and maybe more difficult in the future, but ultimately, I think it has to be representative of the world's community. It cannot be the rich world versus the so-called poor world. It, it, it has to be that representative body, but it has to be based on two th meritocracy and an openness for new innovation and, and not conservative. And I think I would argue those bodies over the years have, have not been sufficiently open to new communities and new ways of working as technology, as innovation changes. We've been too slow to bring those into the mainstream and make use of them. They've largely remained too much in the, uh, in the consumer business, in the day-to-day in the, in the -day lives, our, our mobile phones. We need to bring that into the mainstream and that will be new actors compared to the more conservative past, I believe. Last question. Um, we got some amazingly talented, well-connected, high-achieving people here in the room. If you could ask them to go back and do one thing, what, what would it be? Send me an email with an idea. <laughs> What's your email address, Jeremy? <laughs> you can get that. There's something called the internet. It's... Um... <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeremy Farrer of the Wellcome Trust. <laughs>